All right, welcome to Blender Fast Track Volume 1, Part 3. Together, we're going to finish building out our environment. And we're going to create this exact render that you see right here. We have four areas to cover. Part 1, we're going to start assembling our scene. We're going to prep our assets for lighting and start to lay out the environment utilizing this rock kit right here. The download link is ready and in the description below. Part 2, we're going to use Mixamo, which is a free online resource that we're going to use to integrate the character and motion capture into our scene. Part three, we're gonna start lighting our scene. We're gonna talk about some cinematic lighting techniques and we'll finish laying out the environment. And part four, we're gonna get into compositing. This is where we're gonna take our base render and start to really make it look cinematic. Some tips moving forward. Laying out the environment is not meant to be a step-by-step -step tutorial. Start to branch out a bit and get creative. Try to build the project all the way through and then go back to the beginning and do it all over again. Each time your final result will look better and better. So are you ready for part three? Let's get going. Alright, in this chapter, what we're going to talk about is utilizing online resources. And this is going to be a big part of part three. So I remember when I first started, and this is something that I struggled with a lot, and it was trying to build too much of the 3D scenes from scratch. It's very easy to think that all the textures, the, the HDRIs, the lighting, all the assets, all the models, it's very easy to think that you need to build all these things from scratch to be able to start creating stuff. And, and in my experience working in production and mentoring those breaking into the industry, it can actually be very counterproductive to try to do too much from scratch. So when you're first starting off, it's a bit of a David versus Goliath situation where you are up against an extreme challenge. When you first dive in, you want to start making you know feature film quality work, but it's going to take a lot of time. And even then, feature films, those really high-end CG renders that you see are typically done with a team of people. So you are up against a big battle trying to build a demo reel that will be able to compete with one of those. To give you an example, if you check out my demo reel, for example, and I'll actually just show you a breakdown. If you scrub through here, you'll see that I didn't build everything on my reel from scratch. You know, there was a team of people working with me that contributed to, to each shot. So I had my own part and everybody else had theirs. And on top of that, we still utilized online resources. So texture libraries, motion capture libraries, asset libraries for models. All of those things are very, very valuable to be able to get things done in an efficient way. In part three, we already took advantage of textures.com. They provided us a free texture to use. So thank you for them. I'm not affiliated with any of these uh, companies. I, these are all companies that I personally work with on my own projects and in production. HDRI Haven is another really, really good resource. So we'll be using this one in part three. This library essentially does HDRI. So this is gonna be image-based lighting. We have library like Mixamo. So this is a good character and motion capture library. Um, another really, really good library that we use a lot is Megascans. And this is known for their photogrammetry library. So they essentially take real world images of uh, rocks and textures and all that kind of stuff and then they scan it in and then we can utilize that stuff into our scenes and a lot of the stuff you can actually use in your the in the project that we're currently building so they have a uh, free rock so so take advantage of all of this stuff another good resource is going to be kitbash 3d so they have they also have free stuff that you can download right here uh, kitbash is essentially a library of they build out buildings and worlds and part three is specifically we're going to utilize the rock kit that comes with the project. There'll be a link to download that in the description below. Great. So to summarize all this, when you're first starting out, get to know all of these libraries, get to know what resources you have access to. Don't try to build everything from scratch. For example, if you want to build a lighting demo reel, you wouldn't want to spend 95% of your time uh, very tediously modeling out the entire scene if all you're going to do is show off your lighting work anyway. Great. So in the next chapter, we'll get started building out our scene. All right, so before we start laying out our scene, what we wanna do is we wanna get all of our assets into a consistent scale. And right now our sword is a, a bit big. So to start doing that, what I'm gonna do is just open up the file where we left off. If you want to follow along, if you didn't finish the, finish the last chapters, um, I'm gonna start with this sword final shaded that you can find in downloads for part two. There's a link in the description. 
So we want to prep this in a way that's going to be easiest for you. Uh, some general rules to go by when prepping your assets. You want things to be on a consistent scene scale and you want all of their names to be clean. And we want to get the asset into its own collection. I'll explain more about collections as we go. So currently we have this Paul Mel collection. I'm just going to go ahead and rename everything in now in there to be Paul Mel A, Paul Mel B, Paul Mel C. So I'm just double clicking on each one of these. Paul Mel D just like that. And what I'm going to do here is just drop down a new collection. I'm just going to call this sword just like that. So just double click on its rename, call it sword. And then what I do is move everything. So I'm going to shift click all of these and move all of them into that sword collection. And this is going to be basically allow us to have this to be a little bit easier to use later on. So if we ever want to just in, uh, make it invisible, we have it right there. Next up, we want to fix the scale. So to do that, what I'm going to do is go up to add and we're going to go to empty plane axis. So what is a plane axis? So basically we just get this empty right there. And basically what this empty is if we zoom in here and we start moving this around just like that. It's just an empty axis. It doesn't actually do anything yet. But where the power comes is and we can actually establish a parent child relationship between this axis and our sword so that we can just then just move the axis around and scale the axis around instead of having to move every individual piece individually. So to do that, what I'm going to do is shift click all of these just like that. And the last one I'm going to do is shift click the, the empty. We'll go to object, we'll go to parent and we'll go to uh, object or you can hit control P on the keyboard. And now what you'll see is as I move this around, our sword moves too, which will just make it, make it easier when we get into the bigger scene. I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop this into the sort asset as well. Then you'll notice as soon as I do that, as soon as they belong to the same collection, we actually can see the parent child relationship within the outliner. And what I'm going to do is just rename this to be rig. So a rig is just a general term that we use to define controls that we want to manipulate later on down in the pipeline so that we can leave all of our objects alone and just manipulate the rig. All right, so last step, what we want to do is just get this into a consistent scale. So the scale conversion that I did here, um, if I just go into my scale X, Y, Z while holding the empty down, what I'm going to do is just make this 0 0.0214. So that's just the exact value that I use. And you can see now we have a much more uh, smaller asset that we're working with. And what I'm going to do is file save. And now we're ready to start building out our larger scene. So what I want to do is go up to File, New, General. I'm going to go ahead and save this out. And I'm going to call this Final Scene Version 1. Great. So now in this new scene, what we can do is just we'll go ahead and just get rid of the cube by hitting Delete. And I'll go ahead and bring in the rocks and our sword so we can get started. So I'll do File, Append. So Append is essentially how we bring new files in. So in the download section, you'll be able to find this rock kit that we're using. And what I'm going to do is just select rocks high res. I'm going to go to collection and I'm going to choose rocks. And I'm going to do a pen from library. And then what we get is this rock kit. And we'll kind of dive into this in a bit. Next up, we'll bring in our sword. So I'll go to file pen and then just navigate to wherever you put your sword. So I'm just going to dive into my final shaded sword, go into collections and then just choose sword. Um, we currently have our Parmel. It's probably a good idea to clean that up, um, but we, we actually put everything into our sword. So I'll just do a pen from library. Great. So now if we jump into our outliner, we can see that we have our two collections here and we have our sword rig and we have our rocks. So what I'm going to do is just select my sword rig, go into my move tool and just move that up so we can see it right there and just zoom into that. And just to make sure that everything's working, what I'm going to go do and go is Go into look dev mode by hitting Z on the keyboard, or you can jump jump right there. Or what you can do is click just click this little icon up there. Great. So in the next chapter, what we'll do is we'll start laying out our scene. All right. So now we're going to lay out the initial stones, lay out the initial camera, and start building out the actual environment. So from here on out, you can kind of start deviating. Don't feel like you have to follow these steps exactly. This is really where you start to kind of get into Lego mode where you can start to build this stuff however you want. I'm going to go through a couple of exact settings, then I'll start to speed up as we go. 
So the exact values that I use for the initial stone would be zero, negative 0.7, negative 0.3, negative 72 in X rotation, negative nine, 400. And then in the scale, we're gonna use four, three, four, just like that. And then to start duplicating this around, uh, instead of using Shift D, so we talked about this when we were doing our Minecraft problem. What I'm gonna do is do Alt D, which is duplicate link. Another word for this is instancing. And the key point here is that instead of duplicating the apps, we're going to duplicate linked and instance it, meaning that if we ever make changes to this original rock, they're also going to update on the new rock. So I'll just go ahead and duplicate linked. I'll go ahead and hit enter to drop that. I'm gonna move this up. And the exact values that I use for this is just zero, negative 0 0.3, 0 0.45, and then negative 80 degrees in rotation, negative three, zero, and then 2.5, one, two. And I'll just put it in the exact spot that we need it. And I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, Alt D again. Hit enter, move this up. And the exact values that I use for this one is just 0 0.08, negative 0.2, 0 0.8, 517, negative 17, 57 in rotation, and then scale being 0 0.85, 0 0.6, and 1.1. Great, and then last up, we'll just set the initial rock on the ground. And the exact values that I use for this is gonna be 0 0.1, negative 0.4, 90 degrees, zero, zero, and then scale of one, 0.5, and one. And next up, we'll just lay out the sword. So we'll go to over to our sword rig right there. And the exact transform values that I use for this is gonna be zero, negative 0.15, 1.65, and Z, and then 90 degrees in rotation, zero, zero, and then we'll just leave it 0.2, oops, 0.21, just like that. So we have our initial stone set up, um, and now it's a good idea just to lay out our base camera. So I'll go ahead and just move this rock out of the way. I'll select our camera, and the exact values that I used here are 0, negative 9.3, negative 9.3, 0 0.4, 102, 0, and 0. And then if we go ahead and look inside of our camera using this icon right there, you'll see that we're starting to get our initial frame set up. Last thing that we need to do to establish this initial frame is just adjust our focal length on our camera. So we'll go down into, while we have our camera selected, we'll go down to our camera settings, and then we'll just choose focal length is gonna be 25 millimeters. So that's gonna give it a bit of a wider focal length, which means we're gonna see more of our scene. Um, if you notice, if we click and drag on this, this is how we zoom in and then zoom out essentially like that. So I'm just gonna leave it on uh, 25 right there. Great, and last thing that we wanna do is we wanna get that very cinematic widescreen look. So this is a 16 by nine aspect ratio, which, which is a good general uh, widescreen format. A lot of films use 21 by nine, which can be a very cinematic way to show off your work. So what I'm gonna do is go to, I'll go to my um, output settings. What I'm gonna do is 1920 by 810, and that's gonna be a 21 by nine HD aspect ratio. Great, and then what I'm gonna do is just do file, save, and then, and now we have our initial scene kind of ready to go. And all we gotta do is start filling out the rest of the environment, and we'll get in some lighting techniques as well. But before we do that, we wanna integrate our character. Great, so now we're gonna start integrating our character. And this is Mixamo, so feel free to head over to Mixamo.com. Um, you'll need to log in and register and all of that. This is a great resource for getting motion capture, getting some generic characters for your scenes. You can upload your own characters and then animate them here as well. To give you kind of a tour, we can navigate around our Mixamo scene if we just control if we just use left click and middle click like that, and then we can use our middle mouse button to zoom in as well. So very similar to what we're used to, or you can use these icons over here. So first up, we're just going to find a character that we're gonna use. So, so we'll find the exact character that I used in the cinematic down right here. So it's gonna be this character, Arissa. So you can always search for that up here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click that, use this character. And then if, we'll go to, if we go over to animations, what we're gonna do is we'll just search for walk like that. And then here you can see that we have this massive library of different walks. And if we can, we can search for a run, we can search for, you know, jump or whatever. And you'll see that we have a ton of animations that we can work with. And Mixmo is an amazing resource. So I'll just choose walk. And then I'm just going to choose this third one over there. Feel free to kind of experiment. And then you'll see that we have a walk cycle going right now. I'm just going to click on in place which will just keep it static. That way when we actually bring it into our scene, we can then animate it around our scene freely. So from there, I'm just gonna hit download. 
Um, I'm going to do FBX with scan and then uh, frames per second. I'm just going to choose 24 and just hit download. Great. I'll jump back to Blender when we're ready to go, and then I'll just go ahead and import that into our scene. So um, I've included this all with the project files download, so feel free to grab it from there as well. So I'll just do File, Import, and then we'll choose FBX right there. And then in part three, I have this walking download. Again, feel free to grab it from your own download. I'll go ahead and import. And then from here, you'll see that we have our character. So before we get any further, we just want to kind of clean up the stuff that we've imported into its own collection. So what I'll do is I'll just hit new collection. And then I'll just do, then I'll do just character right like that. And then we have two different things that we get. We have the armature and then we have the meshes. So the armature, if we look in here, this is going to be the actual rig. And if you actually look at this, you'll see some like bone stuff coming out of here. So that's going to be the actual rig that's going to be driving. So just to kind of give you some insight on how character animation works. If you notice as we scrub like this, she'll start to get into a walk cycle. And essentially what's happening right here is the geometry is being deformed based off of this skeleton, based on this, based off of this ar armature. And if we come up here, we can actually see that a little better. If we come down to our object type visibility, go to our mesh and just disable that like that, we can actually see that right there. So this is what's actually gonna be deforming our object. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn that back on. If I, and then what I'll do is just come in here and then just drag and drop our meshes into our character collection and then drag and drop our armature into our character collection as well. And then if we want to actually start laying this character out, all we have to do is select our armature like that. So make sure you select that. I'm just double clicking on that. And then I'm going into my move tool. And then we can start moving her around. So if you're if you're wondering why her, her scale is so small, a uh, fun fact about the project, I ended up integrating the character at the very last step. Originally, there was going to be no character at all. And originally, the sword it was a, a, a great sword. So it was, it was pretty big. Um, and then after getting this, this the character into the scene, I ended up having the, the sword end up being closer to like a claymore. So it ended up being much smaller. But by this time, I had all my cameras done already and the scene laid out already. And just a general note, Eevee isn't a physically accurate renderer. So generally speaking, it's, it's a good practice to work to the scale in Blender. But we're technically going to be working at, at times two the scale, which is, again, is not ideal. But we're not doing any like simulation stuff. So as long as we're working to a consistent scale, um, everything's still going to look pretty good. So what we can do is if we just go into our armature settings, go to our scale tool, and then we'll just highlight all of our scale just like that, and we'll do 0.02. And I'll just get the character into our actual frame. So now all I can do is start laying her out. And then all I'll do is just move her over like this. I'll rotate her like that. I'll jump into our camera view, and we can kind of, at this point, you can kind of feel free to experiment and move this around like that. It's a little tricky to grab it like that. If you want to actually use the object context menu too, so you can actually just click and drag right there on our properties. And the exact values I ended up using are gonna be negative 1.5, negative five, and then negative 3.7. And then we'll, we'll kind of eye up the transform value for the ground in a bit. I'm just gonna get the rotation right. So this is 90 degrees, zero, 166, and then of course the scale. And then what we need to do is just make sure that we come in here and make sure that she's actually going to be standing on the ground just like that. So just make sure that she's in there just like that. And then we can always kind of like just kind of scrub through the timeline like this and find a good pose. So I'm just going to stay on frame seven just like that. Great. So the exact Z value I have right here is just going to be negative 0 0.26. And I'll just go ahead and save that scene out. And you'll notice that we actually, when we dropped in our character, we lost all the mesh right here. So what we have to do is come up here and we'll select each one of these. You could just hit B on the keyboard to highlight select just like that. Um, and then what we're gonna do is drag and drop all of that into character. Great, so next lesson what we'll do is we'll start building out the environment. Great, so before we actually get into lighting our scene, we're gonna start building out the environment just a little bit more. So at this point, I'm gonna start picking up speed. So I'm not gonna go over every exact setting. Um, it should be pretty easy to follow. So if you just use these general techniques that I'm talking about, you'll be fine. Okay, so I'll just, what I'll do is I'll start selecting this stuff and I'll start moving this around. So I'll do Alt D, I'll do Enter, and then I'll start moving this around and rotating it like that. 
Alt-D, moving and rotation like that. And you'll notice that um, the way this geometry is prepped is that actually a little bit tapered off here so that when we actually intersect these things, we'll actually get a nice overlap. So I'll just do Alt-D, move this around like that. And I'll just keep doing this for a bit. And when I do this, uh, what I'm thinking about is just there's going to be a little bit of a, a circle right here around this as we start building. And then I'm just going to make sure that we have a little tunnel as well down here. And again, you can see that our camera is going to be facing this way, so we don't actually have to build this part of the scene out unless it's going to be affecting our scene. So we're going to want to have some sort of shadow interaction coming from this general area. So we want to make sure that we fill in this area as well. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, not nearly as perfect as, as we see on the initial frame. Um, but just a little bit will go a really long way. All right, so for this initial rock, see, I am going to use some exact settings because there's going to be end up being a light shaft down back there that we're going to want to get in there. So the exact settings I use for this one is going to be 5, 5, 0.9, negative 36, 43, negative 208, 32, 0.1, and 4.3. That'll just make sure that whenever we set up our light, we'll get that light shaft right there. And then what I'll do is I'll just start duplicating this stuff. So I'll do Alt-D. I'll just move this up and rotate it around like that. Great, so we've got a good chunk of our scene laid out, but before we get too far, um, we want to start establishing some of our lighting so that we can actually see the lighting as we do the layout. So next up we have HDRIs, and HDRIs are going to be the foundation to image-based lighting. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in an HDRI, I'm going to kind of explain what they are and how we use them as we go. But basically, it's going to be a texture that we use as an environment to light our scene. Great. So to get started, what I'll do is I'll just jump over to shaded mode. And then in here, what I'm going to do is just switch over to rendered. So we're going to switch out of look dev mode and switch over to rendered. And you'll see that we are starting to have our lights right here. We can start to see some shadows going like that. Uh, before moving forward, I'm just going to remember hit save. And then down here in our shader editor, what I'll do is I'll just switch from, switch from object context over to world context. So here we, we can see that we have control over our world. So we can make our world brighter. We can make our world darker. You can see that the actual background color is actually casting illumination right now. And what we'll do is we'll come here to add search and we'll do environment texture. Just like that. Hit enter. We'll go ahead and open and I'll just navigate to my textures. And again, these are in the downloads and in the description below. And then we'll do is cave wall 4K. Um, there'll be a 4K version. There's, there'll be a couple of lower res versions too. So if you have a slower computer, feel free to grab the low res version. I'll hit open image. I'll just go ahead and connect that to color. And then you'll see immediately we start to see that we have this world around us. So this is an ACRI. This is image based lighting. And you can see that. Um, the colors of our scene and the lighting of our scene are starting to match the environment. So if we want to go a step further and actually take a look at this into our sword, you can see that the sword is now reflecting that environment. So if we want to start tweaking this further, what we'll do is we'll do search and we'll do texture coordinate. And then essentially what we're doing right now is we're going to set us up 
to actually rotate this HDR around. We'll do mapping, enter, and I'll plug in generate it into UV vector. I'll do vector into vector. And then what we can do here is if I search right, if I just rotate right here, if we just click and drag on Z right now, you can see that we can rotate the world just like that. So that's the basics of an HDRI, an image-based lighting. Um, the exact values that are used here are 5, 7, 1. So you can see that our illumination is going to be coming, our, the, the bright part of the scene over here is where, gonna, where the main light source is going to be coming from. So we want to make sure that's going from the, the right to left like that. Great. I'll go ahead and save this scene out. Great. So from a technical perspective, we're almost done with lighting our scene. We have a couple more things to do like the atmosphere. But before we actually get there, I want to start talking about some cinematic lighting techniques. So before moving into the scene and actually starting to light our scene, I want to talk about exterior lighting techniques. So when you're first starting out, it's very, very easy to just light the world like the real world works. And it doesn't look very interesting. It looks very flat. You don't really understand why it doesn't look good. You're, you're making your sun, you're making your sky, and it all just kind of looks not very interesting. So whenever you're lighting, it's important to understand that in, a, in the cinematic world, whether it's game, AAA cinematics, films, commercials, you're not necessarily recreating the world with your lighting. What you're doing is you're creating the idealized version of it, meaning you want to make it cinematic. And these are going to be some techniques on how to make your environment lighting more cinematic. So the example that I'm going to use here is Shadow of Colossus. And this game does this really, really well. Essentially, there's two points to this. Dark foreground, atmospheric background. And we're going to see this pattern a lot both in Shadow of Colossus and in the cinematic that was built for Blender Fast Track. So what I mean by this is the foreground, the character is always made to be very dark. And then the background always has this very atmospheric background. So more examples of this. So we see here. So we have this really grand atmospheric background, dark foreground right there. And what that does is essentially does a couple of other things. It helps make the scale of the scene more apparent. It helps bring out the hero character. So being able to very clearly see the silhouette of the character is very important. And the decontrast of the background with the atmosphere helps the scale of the background. So another really good example. So very atmospheric background, really dark contrasty foreground. Another great example. So again, atmospheric background, dark foreground. So to apply this to our scene, we want to try to follow this as much as possible. And I'll kind of break down some examples of the cinematic. So here, for example, the foreground is this, we have the rocks here and we have the character kind of walking in very mysteriously. And then we got this atmospheric background, which essentially pops the silhouette of that foreground character. Another good example is the shot right here. So it's the, we have this really dark foreground, this dark foreground right here, and this very atmospheric background to help pop the foreground. Another really good example. So we do have some light spilling in right there. So it's okay to kind of break the rules a little bit, but we still have this very, silhouetted dark contrasty foreground same thing here so very atmospheric background dark foreground same thing right there great so in the next couple lessons we'll start to kind of unpack this and start to build this into our scene great so to start establishing atmosphere in our scene essentially the workflow is to we're going to make a cube and instead of applying a standard shader to that what we'll do is we'll apply a volumetric shader to that so to, get, so to get started with that, what I'll do is go to Add Mesh Cube. Okay, and then what we're going to do with this cube is just scale this up just like that. Um, the exact settings I used here are going to be 0, 4, 8.5, and then 0, 0, 0, 11, 13, and 9. And you'll kind of wonder, okay, why are we covering this? with our entire scene. And if we look up here with the wireframe, essentially anything that's gonna be in this box is gonna have the volume metrics. So what we'll do here is we'll go over to our object context. I'll go ahead and just hit new. So we have a new material. And what I'm gonna do here is just get rid of the shader right here. And then I'm gonna to go to add search and we'll do volume scatter, just like that. And then if I go back into my rendered mode, and if I plug this in here just like that, you'll see that we essentially have a volume within our scene. 
And if we want to control this a little bit better, what we can do is just come down here and just go down on the density like that. The exact value that I'm going to use, use here is just going to be 0 0.005. And then what I can do here is if you notice, it's going to be a little bit difficult to select. Um, what we can do is go, go over to our outliner. And what we'll do is we'll go up here to our outliner options. We'll turn on this little triangle thing right here, which is uh, just selectable. So basically, by turning that on, what we'll see is we get a little another display here. So we have our eye to hide, and we have our selection here to select. I'll just go ahead and deselect that cube right there. So now that cube will stay, and now I can easily jump in here and select that. And now you can see that we're starting to get some atmosphere going on right here. Great. So, and if we come down here to our properties, to our light, you'll notice that as we go up and down on this, so if we set this to something like 5,000, as, or like maybe 50,000. You'll notice that um, the atmosphere is going to be affected by that light. Awesome. So in the next chapter, what we'll do is we'll start taking a look at lighting gobos. So what a lighting gobo is, is anything that's in your scene that's kind of off camera, that's going to be used as a way to cast shadow into our scene. And a large part of lighting isn't actually the lights themselves. It's actually the absence of light. So we've all kind of been there where we've, you know, we want to, to kind of like spice up our scene and we start adding more lights. And before we know it, we have like 20 lights in our scene and it kind of looks worse than what we started. Generally speaking, you want to use a small number of amount of lights. And in this specific case, we're going to use one to represent the sun. We're going to use the HDRI. And you might want to use, a, you know, one more for like a fill to cast some more a a floodlight into the scene. But we're just going to use two for this scene. So before we move forward, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we establish our key light. So this is going to be our key light. A key light is essentially the primary light of your scene. And typically what you want to do is you want to start with this and then you start building your scene around this. You're, we start building our gobos around this. In this case, our gobos are actually just going to be our rocks. And those are going to be used to, to cast shafts of light into our scene. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of make sure that as a general rule, you want to kind of be at around a 45 degree angle or more when you're lighting. You never want to do this, which is essentially put your light directly parallel with your camera. Essentially what it's going to do, it's going to, it's going to flatten everything out and it's going to make everything look very kind of muddy and not very pleasing to the eye. So generally speaking, um, whenever you're lighting, start off with at least a 45 degree angle and go from there. And the exact position that I ended up using for this is going to be, if we go into our object context, what I'm going to do is just change this to 22.6, negative 11.2, and 14. And again, it took some experimentation for me for me to get this point. So feel free to kind of experiment and I'll kind of show you that as we go. And then to make sure that this is going to be properly illuminating, so what I'm going to do is boost up the lights. So under our lighting properties, um, I I find that the, the sunlight can, you know, cast some we very irregular shadows into our scene. So I'm going to stick with points for this example. And then for the power, I want to do is set this to 50,000. So five, zero, 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 zero. And then we'll just leave the rest of the settings the same. And then to continue building the scene out, what we have to do is just start duplicating these objects. In. So I'll just Alt D, enter to move that around. And as you notice that as I move my rocks, we'll start casting some shadow into the scene. Just like that. And now we can kind of create those shafts of light around the layout of our scene. And before we get any further, you notice how like the lighting right here is super flat. So what we want to do is go into our, our, our rendering settings right here. And we'll go ahead and turn on ambient occlusion. And I'll go ahead and pull that down and we'll go to distance. And I, what I'll do is I'll crank this up like that. And essentially the more distance we have, the more contact shadows that we're going to have in our scene. And I'm just going to leave this as a value of eight. And the factor, what I'm going to do is set it to be point, or set it to be two, which is basically going to be more shadow. And what we can do is just start building out this scene based around where we want our lights. So we can see right here we're getting that shaft of light back there. If I continue to Alt D this and move this up around, um, you can see now we're starting to get um, that shaft coming through right there. I can rotate this around just so we can get a little bit more organic. Um, lighting right there. And again, as you're moving f forward, I would just constantly move back and forth between your camera view and your perspective view. 
And then we're going to want to make sure that we fill in our, our ground right here. So I'm just going to move that in right there. Kind of move this up like that. So you can see now we're getting that shaft of light back there, which is looking pretty good. And I'll just continue to duplicate this around our scene and kind of fill in these areas, kind of scaling around as I need to, just like that. And constantly coming back and forth, looking between my camera and my perspective view. Now I'll go ahead and just fill this area in just like that. And you can see here, I'm just gonna leave that shaft of light open right there so that we can see our sword right there. And right here, I'm just gonna make sure that my, my character is gonna be in shadow. So remember we talked about how having that deep dark foreground and we're gonna have an atmospheric background. So we're gonna to wanna to keep that character in shadow. So I'll just continue to move this stuff around. I'll go ahead and fill in the ground plane just like that. Rotate this around and again, keeping an eye on how far this is gonna go up like that. And moving forward, just continuing to build this out like that. And if you notice at this point, it's still very hard to see our atmosphere. So what I'll do is actually, I'll go into my uh, Q mesh right here and we can start playing around with this volumetric scattering again. So we could go up right here, but a good trick if you don't wanna, the density will actually will cover your scene in a very aggressive way. So what I like to do sometimes is go into this color and over crank the value right here. So if I go to this value and crank this up to something like four, um, you'll see that we really start to get those shafts of light coming in there. So um, that's a bit of a cheat, but um, we're okay with cheating. Great, and if you look at our camera now, we're really starting to see the scene is really starting to come alive. I'm just gonna go back to my layout view so I'll be able to see a little bit better. In my layout view, I'll go ahead and make my selection tools selectable again. I'll go ahead and make sure this is not selectable. And I'll just go ahead and continue to Alt D and fill this in like that. And as we kind of go around, we'll start to scale these up because essentially the stuff that we wanna do, what we wanna do back here is just kind of create some fill um, so we're not necessarily too worried about how the objects look because um, essentially the frame that we're establishing right now, we can't actually see them. So we just want them to cast shadows into our scene. So again, right there on this side, we're gonna leave that opening node. It's essentially where our light's gonna be coming in from. Okay, so we're really starting to make some progress on this. I'm just gonna turn, out, turn off my armature of my character right here, and I'm just gonna make sure that my cube is just not inside of that collection right there. Okay, so at this point, it's really about finessing. So I'm gonna make one more rock right here that's gonna kind of create this little shadow, so it's gonna create a little bit of a texture pattern here. So like, instead of having it be so, you know, it, either it's in light or it's out of light, it's gonna create some more organicness to it. So I'm just gonna duplicate this, this rock that I have right there. And I'm just gonna set these exact values right here. So I have um, 8.1, negative 6.01, 4.8. Rotation I have 236, 8 point, negative 8.25, 112. And the scale is gonna be 0 0.71, 0 0.2, and 2.62 and that'll just be the exact settings that I use for that exact chef so just so we have that um, one there but if you actually see what I have over here we actually actually see this right here how this is going to be creating that chef so that took a little bit of time a little bit of finessing so feel free to kind of play around with that or use the exact settings right here and again that's using rock C to do that great and last little tweak that I'm going to do back here is I'm going to open up another shaft of light back here just by moving these rocks again. So this is a, this is another really good example of using your scene as if they are gobos. So we're getting this really nice detailed pattern back there. Great, and last tweak I wanna make to our scene right here before we get into rendering and compositing. I'm just gonna to go to my EV settings down here. So I'll go to my render settings and I'll go down to color management. 
And what I want to do is go to my filmic settings. So make sure that you have filmic on. And then what I want to do is change the look over to very high contrast. That'll just really punch the scene and really make it very contrasty. So we get a nice contrast between the lights and the darks. Great. And one more step I'll do is I'll just move this light out like that just to open this up just a little bit like that. Great. So in the next chapters, what we'll do is we'll start getting into multi-pass rendering and multi-pass compositing. All right. In this chapter, we're going to start taking a look at multi-pass rendering and multi-pass compositing. So what are these things? Why do we need them? So the goal here is to take our scene from this stage to a final stage, which is going to be this. And essentially our goal here is to take our scene, our render from 3D and try to get it probably 80 to 90% of the way there and take it the rest of the way in compositing. And compositing essentially is a 2D operation. So we have the 3D world and then we have the 2D world. So after we render, we're gonna be performing some 2D operations that are essentially gonna give us some more control over your scene and help us to get to that 100% range faster. So multi-pass rendering. Multi-pass rendering is essentially the process of taking your render and split it into a couple different passes or a couple different renders so that we can then use that later on in compositing. So that's what we're gonna focus on here. So to start with multi-pass rendering in, in Blender, we're gonna use the layer system, the view layer system right up here. And to, to use the view layer system, we have to get, the, get to know the outliner a bit more. We've talked a bit about this here and there, but I'm going to dissect this a lot more right now. So we've talked about the collections a bit. We know that they're essentially containers for objects that are within our scene. And we've talked about how to display things. And we talked about how to turn things off for selection. Um, but I'm going to break this down a little bit more. And if we come up here to our restriction toggles right here, we'll see that we have a bunch more options. I'm just going to add these all of them like that. And then essentially what these are going to do is allow us to have greater control of the visibility for objects when we render. So now after I turned all those on, we see that we have a lot more options here. And some of this isn't quite supported with Eevee yet in Blender. Um, so by the time you're watching this, maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. But if you're using like a render like Cycles, um, all of this should work totally fine. So before we move much further, I'm going to go ahead and clean some things up. So I'm just going to rename my cube to be fog. So we have that in a very clear way to work within the outliner. And before we start rendering, I'm going to go ahead and change my output setting. So I'm going to go to output and then go ahead and change over to, this is going to be what our image gets saved at when we render. And I'm going to switch this over to an open EXR multi-layer. And basically what that means is as we render, start rendering with passes, they'll essentially be stored in one multi-channel EXR file, which we'll talk about more as we go. And I'm just gonna change this to float half. And basically what that's gonna do is make it a little bit lighter for us to work with. Great, so before we actually start rendering, we just need to make sure that our scene is good to go and make any final changes that we want. And we're for the most part, we're pretty good, but we've been doing a lot of scaling of rocks and we might be stretching out some textures. So one specifically that I, I found was this guy right here. So if you look at here, this one's just a little bit too stretched. So what I'm gonna do here is just scale this back up and kind of get that into a, a little bit more of a, a uniform scaled and get it to where my textures aren't actually gonna be stretching out. And then um, this is gonna be our hero piece. This is gonna be our hero area right here. So we just wanna make sure that this is gonna be absolutely perfect. So I'll just go ahead and rotate this around like that. I'm just gonna go ahead and punch in the exact values I ended up using. So we got negative 0.5, uh, negative 0 0.1, 154, negative 16, negative 30, and then 2.8, and then 2.8, and 2.1. Those are the exact values that I end up using. So again, don't feel like you have to use those exact settings, just um, experiment. And if I look in my camera again, we can kind of get a, give a final look of the scene. Great, so now we're gonna be good to go. So our first render, we don't actually need to use our view layers at all, we can just render it as is. So I'm just gonna go up to render, render image, and I'll just go ahead and save this out. I'll do image, save as. Oh, so you can see that our EXR settings are set up right there. I'm just gonna save that and render. And I'm just gonna call this beauty. Um, so a beauty pass is typically uh, the name that we use to describe the main render. So that's gonna be our primary render. I'm gonna be on version four. Great, so next up we need to get an emission pass. And an emission pass, with, with EB, there's not a good way to do that yet. 
But in cycles, you can essentially split this out stuff automatically. So this is going to be a bit of a manual th step for us. So what I'm going to do up here is go up to my view layers right here. And if we just click this little add new layer, you'll see that now we see this view layer one. And essentially, if we toggle between these, you can see that our armature right here pops back up. What's happening? Um, so each one of these view layers are going to store the properties of our collections, our visibility attributes right here, and our renderable attributes. So all of this stuff right here is going to be stored on each one of these view layers. So if I switch over to view layer one, what we need to do, I'll just go ahead and turn off that armature again. So we don't need to be able to see that in the viewport. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the light. So I'll just turn off all these. Technically, all you have to do is turn off globally display and renders, which is uh, the one right here. But I'm just going to turn all of them off just so we have it. I'm going to turn off the fog. So I got the light off, the fog off. And if I do a render really quick, you'll see we're still getting the line. That's because our scene is still being lit by that HDRI, HDRI that we set up. So to turn that off, I'm going to go down to world and I'm going to set this to one. And just be mindful that the settings right here that we just did is a property. It's not a, a view layer. So um, if we switch back to our old view layer, we'll have to uh, bring this back up. So now if I render this, we get an emission layer. So again, this is a bit of an old school workflow um, with cycles and hopefully in the uh, updates with Blender, the view layers will become more compatible and we can do this in a little bit more efficient way. So for now, what I'm gonna do is just image save as, and then I'll just call this emission uh, version one. I'll do save and we're good to go. So in the next lesson, we'll start compositing, which is essentially combining all of our passes and adding on that last 10 to 20% of work. Okay, so let's check out the compositing tab inside of Blender. So if I go over here, we have the compositing view. But before I get started, um, technically you can composite and do all of your 3D work inside of one file. And I know a lot of Blender users like to do that workflow. For me personally, what works best for me is uh, splitting my files out as much as possible. So I like to split it up in assets. So like we built the sword in one file, we assembled the scene in another file, and um, I like to composite in another file as well. And that just helps it to make it a little bit easier and a little bit simpler. So before I get started, I'm just gonna save this. I'm gonna do file, new, general. So now we're in officially a new Blender scene. So I'll just go ahead and save this out. I'll call this final composite version one. And I'll say that, and I'll just go over to my compositing tab. And essentially what we can do now is just kind of prep our, our display here to be able to work. And the first thing that we have to do is turn on use nodes. And essentially what that's, what that's gonna do is, is it's gonna tell Blender to activate the compositing view. And now what I'm gonna do is just kind of clean up the rest of the scene, uh, the rest of the interface. So if I hit N, I'll get rid of my tools. If I right click down here, you can see I have split and join area. So we haven't done this much yet. So if I just do join area, what I can do is actually collapse this right there, which will just give us a little bit more space to work with. And what I'll do over here is I'll just move this over like that so we can get some more space to work with. Great, so the way the compositing view it works very similar to the shader editor. Um, it's just gonna be a bunch of nodes that we essentially connect around and essentially mix things together. So what we have here by default is we have render layers and we have composite. So whatever we plug into composite is what's actually gonna show up when we render an image like this. And currently, we just have our cube and we don't wanna actually want that right now. So if I exit out of this, what I'll do is just delete that render layer. And essentially, render layer, view layers, they're kind of the same thing. And we don't actually wanna use the render layers of the scene, we wanna bring in that render from that we did from the other scene. So I'm just gonna to go to add, search, image. And then what we can do is just open, we'll go to renders, and then we'll do, um, I saved mine out as beauty version four. Great, so what are we looking at here? So if we do render right now, you'll see we still see nothing. If I do plug this into there like that, we'll see when we render, we'll start to see something. Um, but when you're compositing, we're essentially in a very lightweight view because we're just working with images and applying operations to them. So we wanna be able to display this all the time. So some hotkeys that we'll have to get to know here are gonna be control shift and then click like that. And what that's gonna do is display the render in the background. So as we work, we'll be able to see this. And what it dropped down right there is a viewer. So we have a composite view and we have a viewer. So composite view is what's gonna actually be to render image. And then viewer is gonna be what is what displayed in this little backdrop that we see here. So another hotkey that we'll have to get to know is V. So V is gonna be to zoom out and then we have Alt V to zoom in. So I'm just gonna move this up using 
alt middle mouse like that and that'll just move that around like that so we can just give us some little bit more work and what i'm going to do is move this in the top right like that so i can essentially work right over here and we can still see this like that if you're ever wondering why uh, you're seeing like an outline around this if you just double click on any node so if right now if we have our viewer selected right there we see that we got this highlight right there and it kind of puts some stuff in the way so i'll just select something else and that'll go away okay so let's just take a look at how this works so we have our render right here and if i do add i can just start tossing in some nodes and this is going to be a test for us to get to work um some nodes some nodes that i like to use in here a lot some of my favorite ones to use is going to be hue saturation value and this is a really good tool to uh, change the hue of your scene so we can change it if we want like to change it from like this blue scene to a little bit warmer scene we can do saturation which will essentially take the colors and uh, define them as being less colorized or more, more colorized and then we have value which is essentially just how we brighten our scene so you can see like right now we're having a lot more control than what we did in the 3d view great so in the next chapter what we'll do is we'll start talking about some more of these nodes and we'll start building our composite. Great, so moving forward, um, some general tips when you're compositing, like when you're thinking about, okay, what do I do in compositing? What are some things that I should do to all of my renders? And for me, what I find, the three things that are incredibly valuable that I do to most all of my renders is I do a little bit more of shadow work. So we'll talk about that in a bit with vignetting. I'll do a little bit more of atmospheric work and I'll do some color grading work. And essentially, the shadow and atmospheric is just to help make our scene pop a little bit more. And then the color grading is essentially to take it out of this like flat, very neutral color and get it into something a little bit more cinematic. So I'll start talking about that as we go. Great, so what I'm gonna do is get rid of this hue saturation value. And if I hit Control Shift over here, you'll notice that we have a couple different inputs right there. And essentially, if I do Control Shift here, you'll notice that it's gonna rotate between them. So it's very important when you're clicking around right on this that you understand what's happening right here. So the top we have Combined. This is gonna be our essentially our beauty pass. And then we have our Alpha, which we don't actually need to get into here, but essentially an Alpha is the silhouette of your image, which allows you to merge this image over another image. Our Alpha is gonna just gonna be solid white because we haven't actually rendered anything in the background. Our alpha is just essentially gonna be just pure white because we didn't leave the background black at all. And then we have depth. So this is a pass that just comes free with Eevee that's already all set up. And essentially, it's a little bit hard to see right now, but we'll get into this a little bit more. But essentially, things that are closer to the foreground are darker in value, and then things that are in the background are higher in value. So I'll just control shift click that until we're on combined. And first up, we're gonna do a vignetting technique. So I have a couple, so in the download, you'll have a little uh, vignette kit that you can work with. So I'm just gonna go image right there. Uh, and then I'm gonna go to open, I'm gonna to go to textures, I'm gonna to go to vignettes, and then I'm gonna to go to, I'm gonna use vignettes B version one. And I'm essentially gonna add a ton of different vignettes in here for you guys to kind of experiment with. And essentially these vignettes, if I show you a couple different of them, if I just copy and paste this like that, I can go and open a, I can go in and open up another one. So I'll just grab vignette A version two. So just to compare these two, essentially all they are is gradients that we can help use to drive the lighting in our scene. And what that's going to do is give us greater control over the composition and help make the, and help make the render a bit more pleasing to the eye. And we'll talk about more of that as we go. So I'm going to start with this one right here. So I have two of these that we're going to work with. We're going to start with this one. And essentially to merge this on, what we're going to do is an add search, then we're going to do mix. And we're going to be using mix very, very heavily. And a mix is essentially, you can think of this as mixing two different images together. So if we plug this in to the top, and then we plug this into the bottom, and then if we just control shift click on this, you'll see that we essentially are just looking at our vignette but that's not what we want what we're going to do is change this mix over to these blending modes and you can kind of experiment with these but essentially what we're doing essentially what we're doing here is mathematical operations between two of these images so there's a bunch of them and we'll kind of cover some of these as we go i'm going to switch this over to multiply and essentially what multiply is and it's going to take those dark values from our vignette and and darken our beauty render with that then essentially you see that we have this factor, which is gonna essentially be how much. 
So you can see right here what this is doing if we set this to zero. We have really, really flat background right here. And essentially good lighting is all about getting good gradations in your scene. You never want anything to go completely flat in most cases. So this is a good way to add a little bit more of a gradation. So we see that gradation happening there. And it's helped pushing our eye towards the center of the frame. So I'm just gonna set this to be a value of 0.8 and that'll be the final value I have there. Next up, I'm going to start bringing in some atmospheric elements. So I'll go to add search image. Now I'll go ahead and bring this in and I'll just open, I'll go to textures and I'll just do dust particles version one. And if we just view this by control shifting it, you can see all this is is some stock footage with some dust particle elements dust particle elements on it. And essentially we can use stock elements like fire embers, we can use fire, we can use dust particles like this and use them to composite them into our scene. So it doesn't all have to come from 3D. You can take stock elements like this and then put it into your scene after the render to help spice it up. So we're gonna add search, we'll do mix. And I'll go ahead and mix these two together. So I'll do image into there and then image into there. And then I'll just hit control shift click right there. And what that's gonna do is display that. But you notice again, we're just seeing the dust particles. So what we gotta do now is set this over to screen, which essentially is going to add that on. So instead of darkening it right now, it's gonna take the bright values and essentially add those onto the, the, the composite. So we don't wanna do overdo this too much. I'm gonna move my composite view out of the way so we can see this a little bit more. So let's just change this value to a value of 0 0.1. So it's just layering on there a little bit. Next up, we'll start working on some more atmospheric elements. So I'll go to add, image, and then I'll go ahead and open. I'll go to, and I'll just go to textures. I'll go to atmosphere version one. And essentially if we view this by hitting control shift click, you'll see this is just an atmospheric layer that we can use. And if I go to search mix, and then if I just take the composite, plug it in the top, We'll take the, the atmosphere pass and plug it in there. And then we'll plug this, we'll control, control shift click that and we'll set this to screen. So now you can see we're kind of really exaggerating the atmosphere coming from right to left. So we're, it's, we're getting a very clear light direction happening here. So again, we don't wanna to do too much of this. Um, you'll find in compositing, uh, the more you do in very, very subtle amounts, the more organic the comp is gonna feel. So I'll leave this off at a value of 0.15. And then last up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that vignette B right here. So the original vignette that we used, wherever we want the viewer's eye to go to be the brightest. So we'll head, we'll do search, we'll do mix, we'll do uh, hue saturation value. I'll go ahead and plug that in right there. And what I'll do here is I'll boost this up in value to make this brighter. And I'll make this a value of two just like that, but we don't want the entire render to get brighter. We just want what the area with this vignette is. So if we plug this image into factor, you'll see now we have control over just the center of the frame getting brighter, which is a really powerful technique. Great, so that was a look at shadow work and atmosphere. And in the next chapter, we'll start looking at some color grading techniques. All right, so don't forget, when you're ready to follow along, in the description below, what you'll find is these screenshots. Just go ahead and click any one of them, and then you'll get presented with a step-for-step, button-for-button, hotkey-for-hotkey, the exact process of what you need to recreate each chapter. So color grading can be a very in-depth topic. There are people that you know specialize in this one area. So you have compositors, and then you typically have a color grading team that works separately. But the technique that I'm gonna show you guys is a very, very simple technique that you can use on a lot of your projects to really take your renders out of this like very flat, very generic world into a much, much more cinematic world. So essentially we're gonna do a colorization technique. And what I'm gonna do here is just do add search. We'll do hue saturation value. And I'll go ahead and just plug this in like this. I'll make this visible. And what I'll do is I'll desaturate this, like just like that. And then what I'll do next is add in a mix. We're gonna plug that in. And this time what I'm gonna do is set this mix to multiply. And if we set it to multiply with one, essentially the way you can think about this is a white value is one and a black value is zero. So 
anything by times one is just gonna be itself. And anything darker than that is essentially gonna colorize this. So if we go over to image and we start colorizing this, you can notice we can start making it red, we can make it blue, green, so on and so forth. I'm gonna make this a, a warm color like this. And, and the exact value that I use for this is 0 0.07, 0 0.35. So the hue is gonna be 0 0.07, which is gonna be controlling uh, if it's blue or if it's orange or if it's red. So 0 0.075, which will get it in that nice warm tone. Um, saturation is how much of that color is it doing. So the more saturation we do, the more color we see. So we don't want it too saturated. So we'll just do 0.35. And a value we'll just leave at one. Great, so this is essentially too colorized right now. So what we wanna do is actually mix this in with the original composite. So what I'll do here, so I'll do add search mix and I'll plug the original composite into the top. And I'll take our color grade that we did with the hue saturation and the multiply and plug it into mix and I'll go ahead and just view that. And what I'll do here is multiply these two together. So you can see now, instead of just being completely orange, we're starting to get some of those original colors back into our scene. But essentially, we just darken it too much, which is which is not what we want. We don't want to actually darken the scene. So what we can do here is we'll go to add, search, and then we'll do hue saturation value. And then we can compensate for this by putting this here and then going up on our luminous value. So I'm gonna set the luminous value of two, which will just brighten up the scene. And another way to brighten up the scene is gamma. So Gamma is essentially a brightness tool for the gray value. So uh, hue saturation value pushes everything up. Essentially what a gamma does is it takes the gray value and pushes it up or down. So the, the brightest value of the, the render doesn't get any brighter and the darkest value doesn't get any darker, but that those midtones get pushed up and down. So I'll go ahead and plug that in. And then you can see if we go up or down on this. So if I go down, it's essentially bringing those gray, gray values up. And if I go up, it's gonna be crunching them. So what I'm gonna do here is set this to a value of 0.3. Great, so this setup you can repeat on a ton of renders. Um, and then all you have to do is really rotate this image hue around to get different looks and different feels. And in the next chapter, we'll start adding an atmospheric glow to our sword. Great, so to start adding an atmospheric glow to our scene, what, we'll need, what we need to do here is bring in our emission path. So I'll go ahead and bring in an image I'll go to open, I'll go to renders, I'll go to emission version one EXR. And if we just take a look at this, there's our emission path. So this is what we rendered out before. And essentially this enables us to have greater control over the composite. So essentially first thing that we wanna do is just mix this in. I'll mix this in with the original just like that. And I'll plug this in there. And then what I'll do here is again, just screen this on just like that. And I'll go ahead and view that right there. And if you ever notice that the screen does this weird red thing, um, if you ever run into that, you can always just switch this over to add. So add and screen are a very similar operation. Um, again, uh, all these blending modes right here are a bit more of an in-depth topic, so I'm gonna skip over some of them. So but just feel free to experiment with all these. Next up, we wanna take that and essentially bloom it out. So to do that, what we're gonna do is add search for blur. And to see what this is gonna do, I'm gonna plug this into there and I'm gonna view this. And essentially, if we set this X to one and Y to one, and then we play around with our strength, we can see essentially we're gonna be, if I set this to something like 50, we're essentially blooming out that emission. So we're creating like an atmospheric glow. But instead of doing that in EV where it kind of puts it over the whole scene, we have much, a much, much more isolated control here. So now what I'll do is I'll just start copying and pasting. So control C, control V, just like that, I'll plug the composite in, I'll plug this in, and I'll just make that visible. Now you can see we have that nice glow effect happening. It's gonna be a little too much, so I'll just tone the factor down, which will just decrease how much we're actually doing. And then I'll do the same thing, I'll copy, I'll select these two, I'll copy, paste, and I'll move those over like that. I'll just go ahead and plug this in there, this into here, and then this will be our view, oops. So just make sure that we plug in our render right there. And this time what we're gonna do is tone this down. So essentially we're putting a couple different glows on this. One's gonna be very small. So if I view this right there, 
we have two different glows happening. We have a wide one and we have a really tiny one. And essentially that's gonna help create like an exponential glow. And this time when we view this, we'll want to set this up really high like that to really bloom that out. Great, so now that we have everything together, we can kind of look at our glow and kind of take it back a little bit. So right now it's a little bit too much with both of these on here. So I'm gonna go about half on the bottom right there. And then on the top one, what I'm gonna do is set this to something like 0.25, which will just decrease it down a little bit more. Great, so that was a look at atmospheric glowing on our runes of our sword. And then in the next chapter, what we'll do is we'll start taking a look at the final tweaks to our composite. Great, so some final touches on our composite. What I'm gonna do is just drop down our curves. So we'll do RGB curves. And I'll go ahead and just plug this in. And essentially what curves is gonna do is it's gonna allow us to brighten up and dark our image with this curve tool right here. And essentially if we just start clicking in here like this, um, we can start adding this S curve right here. And essentially this is gonna mimic um, a photographic look in the sense that if we look right here with our old composite versus our new one, um, you can see that we have a lot more control over the brights and the dark values. So essentially what we're doing is we're gonna balance this out just like that. And essentially, the more desaturated you make, the more of a curve that we have up here, the more desaturated that we have in our highlights, which gives us a photographic look. And the more of a crunch that we have down here, the more saturation that we push into our blacks, which also gives us a photographic look. Great, so some final touches, um, whenever I'm kind of like done building my composite, I always kind of come through, come back through here and make some final tweaks. And some final tweaks I'm gonna do is, again, the glow right here, again, I think we're kind of overdoing this. I'm just gonna tone it back a little bit more. So I'll just go to the add node, I'll do 0.25. Yeah, and then I'll do maybe like 0.15, we'll see how that looks. Uh, maybe like 0.2, something like that. Um, we don't wanna overdo it with the, the glows. And then one more thing is the character right here. So we talked a lot about how we, we want to have a dark foreground, atmospheric background. And we kind of have that, but the character here is, is we can see a lot of it. Essentially the contrast values here are essentially too much. So we wanna darken that a little bit. And then what we can do is use our depth pass to darken the foreground. So I'll go ahead and go back all the way back here to our uh, beauty image right there. And essentially what I want to do here is utilize that depth pass. So if I go to search, what I'm going to do is put down a color, put down a mix. And what this mix is going to do, if I just go to make this visible and I plug this in to depth, we'll see that essentially we're not seeing anything. Um, so if we set this to multiply, essentially we'll essentially multiply that white value to our depth so now we can see our depth. So remember again, anything multiplied by white is just gonna reveal the original. But now what we can start doing is take this color value here and darken it like that, which is gonna to start to expose more of our scene, which is what we want. The exact value that I'm gonna use here is gonna be 0.25. And then what I'm gonna do here to gain more control over this is add in a color ramp. And again, you might have to kinda of get used to this in the sense that we're moving a lot of stuff around. So uh, feel free to give yourself some more space when you're working like this. And this color ramp, essentially what we can do is now we can clamp the background like that. So what I'm looking at right here is I wanna make sure that we're not seeing any of the mid ground or the background in here. So I'll clamp it like this. And then what I'll do is I'll take the black value and crunch it like that, just like that. Great, and then what I'll do here is mix this in with the original. So I'll go to add, search, we'll do mix. I'll plug this over the top, plug this on the bottom, and then I'll just go ahead and multiply just like that. And if I view this, we'll see that we're now darkening this just like that. So good, I'll go ahead and make this a value of something like 0.8. So we're darkening it, but we're not doing too much. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll go, we'll take our composite and bring it all the way to the front. We'll make our RGB curves visible, just like that. And then we can see, we'll plug in our composite.
Great, and then I'll just go to render image. And there we go, that's our final composite. So with this composite stuff, if you feel like you're struggling, just know that this is kind of more of an intermediate thing. A lot of beginners and even intermediate 3D artists don't really get in this stuff. It's usually the last stage of the pipeline. And if you can get used to this stuff early on, you'll really start to speed up your workflow. So I definitely encourage you to try to tackle this the best you can. And to kind of wrap this up, I'll just go to image, save as, I'll go to renders, and I'll just type in Fido composite, and I'm on version four. Great, so now we'll start talking about some next steps moving forward after Blender Fast Track. All right, that is a wrap for the entire series of Blender Fast Track Volume 1. Some tips moving forward. If you feel like you're tweaking the rocks and the lighting for hours on end, keep going. Lighting takes time, and it's a very simple process, but it's a very tedious process. Try building the project all the way through once, and then start all over and do it again. Each time you will get better. If you've enjoyed this series, we'll have more content just like this when the site launches this fall. In the meantime, keep it right here on our YouTube channel. I'll be doing a Q&A video to wrap up the series. Leave any questions that you have down in the comments below. Help each other out. And in the meantime, how's your composite looking? I'll see you next Thursday.